Kia ora koutou. And happy World Metrology Day. I'm Rebecca, I'm one of the team, as Annette said, that is building a kibble balance for New Zealand. At our World Metrology Day two years ago, my, doc, my colleague Dr. Fong gave a talk about the MSL kibble balance as well. He specifically talked about the challenge that we've set ourselves and gave a progress update. So today I'm going to talk about what's happening internationally with kibble balances, followed by some of the more recent developments here at MSL. At our World Metrology Day event three years ago, we had a fancy cake to celebrate, as you've seen, that the kilogram was indeed redefined for many of the reasons set here. So what does this mean? It means that instead of being defined by the international prototype kilogram, our kilogram is now defined in terms of Planck's constant, H, which is a fundamental constant of nature. In this way, mass joins the other SI quantities, which are also defined in terms of constants of nature. You won't find any meter bars around here. And one of the really big advantages is that being freed from a single artifact means that in principle, we can measure or make, or yeah, realize this SI unit of mass anywhere, even on Mars, and at any point on the mass scale from a ton all the way down to a nanogram, maybe even to the weight of a single coronavirus. We are only limited by our measurement technology. Well, this is all well and good in theory, I hear you say, but how do we actually get there? There are two established methods that can be used to, that can use Planck's constant to determine a mass value of an object. These are the silicon sphere and the kibble and joule balances. However, we aren't actually yet at the stage where you could take your mass standard to one of these and get a calibrated mass value. That may seem a bit odd to you. This is because we've actually only had one key comparison between two labs using silicon spheres, four using kibble balances, and one operating a dual balance. And the results between these labs differed by about 70 micrograms at most which isn't quite good enough yet. So instead of offering independent realizations of the kilogram from these labs, we're in a phase where we're using a consensus value for the kilogram. And we'll keep being in this consensus value phase until we've established consistency and stability. So where does that leave us? Our MSL cable balance could be used to contribute to the consensus value or to directly realize a kilogram it depends on when it's operational. Before I talk more about kibble balances, for those of you who haven't been to about five of these talks already, how does it work? Here's the operating principle. A kibble balance compares the gravitational force on a reference mass, which you'll see here. And this is compared with the electromagnetic force on a coil in a magnetic field when a current is running through the coil. We can also use the voltage generated by moving the coil in the magnetic field with no currents applied to get information about the mag magnetic field strength. With these two pieces of information, we can derive an expression where electrical power is equal to mechanical power. For those who like algebra, rearranging gives us mass. Then by measuring quantities like voltage and current, from which we can link to Planck's constant, and gravity and velocity, which come from the force balancing, we can get the mass value. It all seems easy, but to get it really accurately, we need to make all of these measurements with great precision and simultaneously. And that is the challenge of a kibble balance. And in most kibble balances, the uncertainty, the main contribution to the uncertainty comes from misalignments of the motion with gravity. So globally, Nobody wants to stay in the consensus value phase forever. There's a huge amount of investment going on into reducing alignment errors. And the improvements that are necessary depend on what kind of kibble balance you're talking about, what kind of mechanism. And there are lots of different mechanisms. And I think they're quite interesting, the creativity there. So I'm going to dwell for a few minutes on giving some examples. In the previous slide in the diagram, it's had a beam balance, which you'll think of as your two pan 
old fashioned two pan balance where there's a beam pivoting on a knife edge. That mechanism was the original, original one and it's so far been the lowest uncertainty value. Another original mechanism was the wheel, which is a slight variation on the beam balance. The wheel is also pivoting on a knife edge, but instead there's a titanium wire going over the top, connecting the mass and the coil. And that avoids some of the lateral motion. If you imagine your beam balance moving, the ends of that are going to be moving slightly side to side. So that motion is avoided. But we still have a lot of flexibility in the swing or the rotation of the wire. And as we've mentioned, this kind of motion gives you more error. So here at MSL, you may remember a wonderful man called Chris Sutton and his experience with pressure balances led him to propose a twin pressure balance as a balance mechanism. Twin pressure balance looks schematically like this. And this is what we're using for our kibble balance here. It's the only design proposed that uses pressure to be the balance mechanism instead of some kind of mechanical arrangement. As far as alignment goes, the main advantage here is that a pressure balance naturally constrains the motion to one axis, the axis of the piston cylinder unit here. And that concept of using a piston to guide the motion has been picked up by a couple of other labs. Um, and they've actually further constrained the motion using motor guides and mechanical couplings and not using the pressure aspect. However, this concept of, you know, the, of having a constrained motion has prompted the communi community to think of the alignment problem in a different way. Specifically that a known and repeatable trajectory is as good as a precisely vertical motion. And this insight has, um, where's my mouse going? This insight has spurred a new generation of cable balances that are based on flexures. And flexures heavily constrain the motion of, um, to a fixed path. Here's an example of a flexure. And if you've come on our balances and weighing training course, you might recognize it. Or if for some other reason you've taken apart an analytical balance, you might also recognize it. Um, some of the flexures are extremely complicated, like this 13 hinge contraption, which is a feat of Swiss engineering, and others are more, sim more simple, like what you might find in a seismometer. And the main attraction of the flexure is that it's very robust. And this has prompted um, quite a few labs to now start focusing entirely on smaller cable balances where the flexure element um, allows them to commercialize this for the mass market. Yes. And um, yeah. How could I forget my one pound? <laughs> yeah. So this list is not complete. I could go on. There are many other um, design, many other designs around. And the variety is encouraged because it re could reveal systematic errors that are present. Coming back to the MSL balance mechanism, because it is really unique, the international community is actually quite curious to see, or well, there's a lot of interest in how it will behave compared to the other designs. So we'll move on to the MSL kibble balance, the second part of my talk. What have we been up to? We've been working on many different parts of the MSL kibble balance. And one of the big developments of last year was figuring out how we're gonna put it all together. Where are all the bits going to go in order to design a vacuum chamber around them? And this is our current model for how it will all fit together. I'll walk you through it. In the middle, we have our two twin pressure balances, um, our twin pressure balance made of two pressure balances with the mass weighing platform on the top and a mass relocator for four masses. And then, down here, we have a coil, which is hiding inside the magnet system. And I've just got a little bit of an expanded view of what's going on inside the orange parts. So you can see a cut through with the twin pressure, with the pressure balance and the coil. And then there'll be a laser that's looking at the position of the coil 
from either above or below, depending on what, what fits in the chamber. So for the rest of this talk, I would like to give um, a little bit of a deep dive into what I've been doing, uh, trying to adapt the twin pressure balance for life inside a kibble balance. So here's this diagram again. I have color coded the floating parts of the pressure balance in orange. And for those of you who are familiar with pressure balances, you'll immediately spot a problem. The bell shape is, so this, this floating part here is connected to the coil by wires or rods that go through small holes in the magnet. Now, the floating part of a pressure balance is usually also spinning this way. And that spinning prevents any contact between the piston and the cylinder. However, in a kibble balance, we've just said there can't be any rotational motion. Everything has to be along this vertical axis. So our proposed solution is to convert our pressure balances into rotating cylinder pressure balances. The rotation doesn't need to be fast, it could be just about half a hertz is all we need to get this self-centering force to prevent piston cylinder contact. But by introducing a rotation, we could also introduce a tilt or a wobble, and that would make the coil move out of alignment. To keep any alignment errors to below one part in 10 to the 10, which is what we need for a kibble balance, the coil can't move off axis by more than four microns. I might also just add here that we can't use magnetic bearings because we've got a great big magnet and we don't want to magnetize our masses as well. Um, we can't use normal lubricants because the whole system is in vacuum and the pressure balance needs a source of clean nitrogen gas to come into this region here underneath what is now a rotating cylinder. And this, so this is a, a pressure difference of about one atmosphere between this region and the surrounding vacuum. You know, no problem. So we've come up with two designs. The first is with machine tool grade angular contact ball bearings. The second is with a custom air bearing with a reduced gas flow. The aim is to see which of these two options gives the lowest run out and the lowest noise, and ideally it would be the same option. We'll take a look inside the assembly. It's a bit of a complicated diagram, a cut through. The blue parts are floating and these are now only constrained to vertical up-down motion. The green parts are now rotating. So this is my friend, the Russian doll of cylinders. This cylinder here is the cylinder of the piston cylinder unit. It's inside a cylindrical cylinder housing, aptly named, which is inside a bearing unit, which is made of two concentric cylinders, housed in a cylindrical bearing housing. All of these cylinders have axes. And in order to get the innermost cylinder rotating with the least wobble, the cylinders must be manufactured to be as round and as symmetrical as possible. And all of this must result in the coil not moving more than four microns, which results in a total run out of the whole assembly of no more than 14 microradians. For those of you who are in the game, achieving this level of precision rotation requires ultra precision bearings and ultra precision machining. And we've really pushed the limits of what our New Zealand machinists are capable of. However, with much help from length standards and measurements around the country, we have measured all the parts that have been manufactured. We have all the pieces. We've assembled one of the units, which you can see on the lab tour. And in the next few weeks, we will find out whether we have managed to achieve the level of precision rotation that we're after. Fingers crossed we have, and then we can do some research on what a, pre what a rotating cylinder pressure balance is like and how that behaves and how it compares with a regular pressure balance. This is just one aspect of what we've been working on for the last couple of years. There are many others. Here's a quick picture tour for the benefit of those online and those of you who are here can come and see what we've been doing in the Kibble Lab. That's the interferometry setup, which currently looks like this. We also have 
a magnet which we've investigated the field with a Tesla meter. We have a test coil and we've tested that we can indeed generate a force using our current source, home built. As for the mass handler, we're testing some pneumatic guides or pneumatic actuators um, because these promise lower heating than motors and heating is a problem in a vacuum chamber. Talking of a vacuum chamber, we've got our friendly Dalek, which is currently in production and should be arriving shortly. So this is a small glimpse into what we've been up to. Come quiz us on the lab tours. In case you're wondering why we're doing all of this, I would propose that one reason is because it's fun and another reason, many other reasons. So in the process of tackling some of these challenging aspects of Kibble balances, um, we can solve metrology pro problems, lead to new capabilities, better capabilities, and also develop the research scientists here at Gracefield. Secondly, when our Kibble balance is operational, we will have direct traceability for mass, pressure, and related standards here in New Zealand. And maybe we might even be the only Kibble balance operator in the region. With the developments of the last few years, you can see that having this kind of resilience for our mass standards is really advantageous in a time when we've got disrupted supply chains all around the world. And last but certainly not least, the uniqueness of the MSL Kibble Balance design means that MSL can contribute to global metrology research, which is something that we've always done and always tried to do. And this enables us to collaborate with scientists from other NMIs. It's a big project. It's definitely a team effort. So I'd like to acknowledge the whole team, including those not pictured here, and also Chris Sutton and Mark, Mark Fitzgerald, who did the foundational work for the project. And thank you for your attention.